The following presentation is brought to you by Perusia. Please stay tuned at the end for more information about the many fine resources available from Perusia. Ten things that you can do to divorce-proof your marriage. These are not in any particular order, by the way. So they're not like any special order, like, oh, this, you have to do this first, you have to, no. It all goes together. So I just put them in this order just because. All right, the first one is affection. Affection. Very simply, uh, creating, an envir- creating an environment that clearly and repeatedly expresses love. Creating an environment that clearly and repeatedly expresses love. You know, through words or cards or gifts or hugs or things like that. Now, my wife needs a lot of affection. I don't. So I'm not a very affectionate person. Now, I'm not blaming anybody for that. But part of it is because in my house growing up, I never once ever saw my parents affectionate toward each other. So I had no understanding or perspective or experience of what was that was supposed to look like. Again, I'm not blaming anybody, I mean, but I'm just saying, I never saw it modeled for me. So now, my wife, though, however, came from a very loving home and all this stuff, and the parents always showed affection, and she was the only girl, and she got spoiled, and she did that. so she likes a lot of affection. So what do we do? How do we make this work? Very simply this. Because I'm the chief servant, I have to die to myself and live for her. So that means I have to do the, some things that don't come naturally to me. For example... I know she likes affection. So I remember one day, I, for no reason, I just drove to the store, I got her some flowers, and I got her some candy. And I drove home. I walked through the door, my oldest daughter Claire said, "Uh uh-oh daddy, what did you do? (laughs) And I said, I didn't do anything. I said, I just want to show mommy that I love her. So I put the, so now the girls, especially my my daughters, they're excited. Put the flowers, get a face, get a face. Put the flowers in here, put the candy. No, no, put it like this, put it like this. No, put the thing like this. And so they're arranging everything and making it all look nice. And my wife walks through the door and she sees the flowers. What is this? And the girls are all standing there. And she goes, what is a candy? What is this? And I say, I just did it because I love you. And the girls are like, yay! Huh? That li- a simple little act like that, that normally, because my wife likes to hold hands, and so I, I, I just not into that, you know? But I have to do it because it's important to her. Because it's important to her. So I have to die to myself and live for her. Very simple things like that. Show affection. Because see what happens. What happens? The danger is that over time, because when you're courting, you open the door for her. Here you go, honey. You know, the little courtesies, the little things, all the little things that you do. And then you get married. It's almost like you compartmentalize your relationship. Okay, I'm married. I got that part done. Now I can work on my career. Okay, I've got her now. Now I can... And you forget. And those little courtesies, those little affections, those little cards, those little notes, those little gifts, those little things you used to do for each other, go away. Because now you're busy managing the marriage, the mortgage, the bills, the kids, all the stuff that goes along with it and I know people that have been married. There's a friend of mine married for 35 years and got divorced. He was, mar- he was married longer than he was single. And I asked him what happened. And you know, you know, you, you, you know what, I, what I hear. 
we grew apart. Or when the last kid left the house, I turned and said, who are you? They were strangers because they didn't work at the marriage. They worked at managing the, ma- the marriage, but they didn't work with each other. Affection is one. Now, I'm not saying just women need affection. There's some guys that aren't like me that could use a little more affection too. So it goes both ways. But in my experience, my wife needs a lot of affection. For Another example. I fly in from the airport. My wife picks me up. I, I'm tired. Even though you're, you're on the plane or whatever, I mean, you get tired from traveling. I jump into the passenger seat. I plop down, and the van's not moving. She's not leaving yet. And I turn to her. She's like, she's waiting for it. Show me you're happy to see me before we move this car. You know, that, uh, that, she needs that kind of stuff. That, those little things often make the biggest difference. To, that the spouse knows that she or he is appreciated. That's what those little things do. And so I started doing things like that. Little thing here, little thing there. Not every day, but you know, just once in a while. Makes a huge difference to, because those little things, which I don't think is a big deal, because I don't need that. Boy, that really shows her that she's loved. That I'm thinking about her. Hun, you're thinking about me. Yeah, that's right. I was thinking about you. That's why I did it. Yeah, you know. I mean, but it's, it's wonderful. It's wonderful to see her response, huh? So affection. That's number one. Again, number one. Not in any particular order. Number two, sexual fulfillment. Oh, this is a good one. <laughs> um... The thing, the thing I learned about this, because again, uh, had to learn this on my own, not from my parents about where babies come from and all that. I noticed that women want to feel close so they can have sex, while men want to have sex so they can feel close. It's backwards. So what would happen in our house? I'd be in the mood. I go, I climb into the bed or whatever. My wife is reading. You know, she's reading. And I make a little advance. She's like, oh, cool. Takes her glasses off, puts the book down. And she turns toward me and she says, honey, guess what Claire did today? Hun, I don't care. This ain't the time to be talking about what Claire did today. It's not time for that. But, but what was the point? And I, it took me a while to get this. Because remember, guys are a little slow. We have to experience something in order to know. We're a little slow. So it took me a while to get this. But what I figured out was the reason why my wife would always want to talk when I didn't want to talk during that time, because she wanted to feel close. So that she can then, because because me just coming in there and all of a sudden just wanting to think, I mean, Women need like to warm up a little bit. So she wanted to talk. She wanted to, because she wanted to feel a connection so that she can engage more fully. It took me a while, but once I got it, now I go in the room. I maybe got a little uh, massage oil for her feet because she always likes to have her feet massaged and, you know, and those things. And I got everything ready. And so when she sees that, she knows what's going on. So then she'll put the book down. Okay, tell me about what happened there. Or tell me about this. Or let's, what's going on? She's a psychologist. What's going on with your private practice? You know, and she'll just, we'll just talk and talk. And I'll, I'll take the oil and I'll start rubbing her feet while she's talking. And da da da, you know, da da da. And I'm being very patient and very, very and then da 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 da. But, but see, the reason why that's so great, because then we get into it, it's like close the windows, put the towels under the door, because it's getting loud in here. <laughs> because now that she because I was able to allow her because I because I was patient enough and open enough to let her feel close she can now engage in a way that I need her to engage so you know we're breaking windows man it's, it's getting crazy but that's the kind of response see 
It's, it's awesome. And she, and she gets it and I get it. And it's, it's a wonderful relationship. And the thing is, the other thing we're not doing is contracepting. We are not doing that at all. Now, some people don't trust that or some people don't. You know, I told this story the other day. I preach homilies and I preach the truth. <laughs> I preach the truth in love, but it's going to be the truth. And in my parish once, I preached on natural family planning and against contraception. And a guy came up to me and said, I want to talk to you. And I said, okay, not here in the presbytery. Oh, great. So I take my vestments off. I go in. What's the problem? I didn't like your homily. Okay. Which part? All of it. What's going on? Well, my wife doesn't want to have sex with me anymore. Ooh, that's not good. How long this been going on? About a month. Oh, I see. Are you guys contracepting? Look, Deacon, let me explain something to you. All these Catholics out here that you're preaching to, they're all contracepting. The church needs to stop being in the Middle Ages and get with the times and forget about all this stuff and just get with it. I said, look, dude, I asked you a yes or no question. He said, of course we are. What has that got to do with anything? I said, we'll get back to that. I said, tell me about the last time this happened with your wife. He said, what do you mean? I said, you said your wife doesn't want to have sex with you. What does that look like? I mean, what happened? He said, oh, well, I came home from work. We had dinner. The kids were away. So after a while, I made the advances. I got you. And my wife said to me, I don't want to have sex with you right now. And I waited for the rest of it. And he didn't say anything. So I said, that's it? He said, yes. And you're mad. Yes. Let me see if I understand. Did your wife tell you, I don't love you anymore? No. Did your wife tell you, I don't ever want to have sex with you ever again? No. You said that she said, I don't want to have sex with you right now. You say, okay, baby, what about an hour from now? You been give her that much? No. Then why are you so angry? Disappointed, I can see. Been there. But why are you so angry? And he couldn't tell me. I said, I'll tell you exactly why you're angry. Because love and life are two things that God never intended to be separated. Love and life are woven into the very fabric of our being and existence. We, look, we saw that together in Genesis 1 and 2. It's part of how God made us in his image and likeness. I said, what you're doing by contracepting, you're forcing two things apart that God never intended to be separated, love and life. And when you do that, there's an emptiness, a chasm, a void, a hole that has to be filled. And what are you filling it with? Porn, alcohol, drugs. Your job, all the, your, and what is it? It's a black hole that's falling down into nothing. And this gap never gets any closer because the only thing that can fill that gap is the love of Jesus Christ. And I took out my wallet and I slammed it on the table. And I said, I bet you everything in my wallet that after your wife said that to you and you got mad, you went to your computer and you took care of things yourself, didn't you? He said, yeah, I did. I said, the reason you did that, because you are a slave of Satan. 
You're a slave. You're a slave to pleasure. See, pleasure is not a bad thing at all. God gives us pleasure because pleasure is something at a very human, a very bodily level that helps raise our minds and our hearts to God. So, for example, when I gave my wife the chocolate, she'll bite into one. She's oh, God, that's good. Because the pleasure of the chocolate is something at a very base level that God uses, of course, at a deeper level, a higher level, the sacraments, to bring us into close relationship with him. It's, so pleasure is a means to our ultimate end. What Satan does, he reaches into this model. He takes pleasure out of its proper context of a means to an end. And he pulls it over in the culture and he holds it up and pleasure is now an end in itself. Pleasure is now your God. So it doesn't matter if it's your wife, if it's your hand, if it's a computer screen, if it's another woman, it doesn't matter. Because all you want, you don't care about your wife because your wife is now your whore. What you care about is the pleasure that you get. And that kind of mentality is a slave mentality. You are a slave of Satan, period. I told him that straight to his face. And I said, the reason why you did that, because there's some hurt, there's some pain. And what do we do as men? We we don't want to confront it. We cover it over. I'm manning up now. I'm going to do it. And you don't don't want to, we're afraid to break ourselves open and pour ourselves out before our wives. Because we think that makes us weak. And what does Paul say in Galatians 2.20? It's when I'm weak, it's then I'm strong. Weakness is realizing that we can't do this on our own. We need Jesus Christ of every moment, of every second, of every day of our lives. I said, you're trying to cover some pain with pleasure. And he started tearing up. He said, what do you do? I said, seriously? Me and my wife, we just go for it. Whatever happens, happens. But when we're disciplined, we use natural family planning. He said, what's that? So I had to explain it to him. He says, I don't understand. When you're in that non-fertile time and your wife isn't into it, what do you do? I said, I'll even do better than that, my friend. I'll tell you what really happens. I'll be gone overseas or some trip for a week or two. And I'll come back. So it's been a while. And I'm ready to go. You know? I come back home. I unpack my bag. I'm putting my dirty clothes in the hamper in the bathroom. You know, I'm singing, tonight, tonight. I put my clothes in thing. And I turn around and look in the garbage. Oh, no. I got to wait another week now. Oh, come on. Really, God? So now what do I do? Because now I got to wait another week. What do I do? I said, look, when that happens, I have 3,000 books at home on philosophy and theology. The closest one in my bedroom is the Summa Theologica by St. Thomas Aquinas. And when that happens, and I, I, I grab the Summa, I go into my office, and I start reading St. Thomas Aquinas so that feeling goes away. Because reading St. Thomas Aquinas will kill any sexual desire you have in your body. <laughs> Trust me, men, it works. In fact, I can show you an email from another man that I said this to at a conference, he said, Deacon, holy cow, it works. <laughs> and I told, that, I told the guy, I would rather do that than to turn my wife into a thing, into an object, into a non-person. Because every day of my life as her husband and the father of her children, I want to see her the way God sees her. I want to look at her and I want to look at at every woman through God's eyes. That's why I will never contracept.
Number three, conversation. <laughs> you know, it's not, here's what I had to, here's the biggest thing I had to learn about conversation with my wife. That she always doesn't want me to fix everything. You know, women talk on average three times as much as men per day. Well, you agreed a little too quick with that, bro. No, you in the blue shirt, man. You're like, oh, yeah, she talk. I'm just kidding with you. No, but seriously, women talk about three times as much per day as men. So when my wife would, oh, hon, we'd be at dinner. Oh, hon, you know, oh, that supervisor at my job. And da, 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 da. And she'd be telling me, tell, I said, okay, hon, here's what you need to do. First thing, I said, well, well, she goes, what are you doing? I said, well, you told me something going on. I'm helping you. I don't need you to help me. I just wanted to talk. I said, and why'd you tell me all that? Then if you're only to help you fix it. I don't need you to help me fix it. I just want you to listen. I did listen. Now I'm helping you fix it. I mean, we would have stuff like that all the time. Again, I'm a little slow. It took me a while to figure out that she just needs to talk. We don't do that as guys. Remember, we A, B, C, D, E, done. Not my wife. So I realize now, she'll come into my office. Hon, I need to talk to you. So instead of, okay, yeah, go ahead. Well, I'm working. I hit save, or I hit pause, whatever I'm doing. I hit stop, and I turn to her. I said, yes, hon, give her my full attention. To make, not only so I can hear what she says, because if I don't look at her, I don't, you know, because I have a tendency to wander off when she talks too long, but, but also makes her feel like what she's saying is important. So I turn my attention. Yeah, and she tells me what's going on. Why else is communication important? Disciplining the kids. I'm the enforcer, okay? So let's take Benjamin. It's always my son. What is it about the boys? Benjamin. Benjamin, my wife. Benjamin, clean your room. Okay. 15 minutes later. Benjamin, clean your room. Okay, mom. Yep. There's, she goes in. Has, he hasn't done anything. Hasn't even been in the room. <sighs> Hon. I lean out of the office. Benjamin, he gets up and runs and starts cleaning his room. My wife, I hate when you do that. But when I have to talk with my girls about something disciplined, they came home late or something like that, I need, I need to do that. So I tell my wife, not tell me what to say, but how should I approach? See, my wife knows my children's hearts. And the way I talk to one kid, it can't, I can't talk to all the kids the same way. Like, if I were to yell at my oldest daughter, she would break down in complete tears and cry. And everything I'm trying to get across would be lost. Because all she's just, just emotional wreck. If I yell at Angela, our second one, she, she'll take it. She's no problem. But, if I, but I have to, so I, hon, how do you think I should approach this? Well, I'm not telling you what to say, but we get this point across, this point across, and this point across. Okay, come here, sit down. And I'm thinking, so I say it the way I say it, but I get this point across, this because I consulted with my wife. But honestly, what is the whole key that a lot of couples really miss in all of this? Praying together as a couple. I cannot tell you how many people come to see me in the parish who are not even from our parish? They see me on TV, on EWTN. Oh, he can save our marriage. So they come to see me in the parish and we sit down in the parlor and they go back and forth. He did this and she did this. And da, da, da. So when I finally jump in, intervene, um, excuse me, can I ask you guys a question? How often do you guys pray together? I don't mean meal prayers. Bless us, O Lord, in these thy gifts. When 
do you guys actually sit down together, maybe on the edge of the bed, on the living room, somewhere, and just pray to God together? You are one flesh, aren't you? I mean, for example, when you got to know him, could you do it without talking? Did you just look at him and just you look at him for five minutes? I know everything about you. Is that the way it works? You have to talk to him, right? So how could you have a relationship with God if you don't talk to him? And they look at me like, I said, if your answer is your wedding day, that's why you're here. What's the biggest reason why couples don't pray together? The lamest excuse. I don't have time. I don't have time. Let me tell you what I don't have time is code word for. It's not important to me. The reason why you don't pray with your wife or your husband, the reason why you don't go to adoration, the reason why you don't pray to rosary, the reason why you're not as spiritual as your wife or you're not being the priest in your home because it's not important to you. Stop lying to yourself. Whatever you're doing, instead of doing that, that's what's important to you. Watching your television, working at your job, doing whatever it is, instead of doing those things to strengthen and build your marriage, that's what's important to you. Now, let me remove the excuse. Well, she's the spiritual one. I don't, I, I'm so uncomfortable praying with my wife. You know, I got my prayer and she's got her prayer and we just do our separate thing and, you know, we just can't pray together. I was a Benedictine. I like old dusty books with big ribbons, with Latin and chanting. I like formal structured prayer. My wife grew up in Oregon where there's a lot of greenies. The trees and nature. She likes to walk through the woods and just open her heart to Jesus and let the prayer just flow out and just, to, and oh, <laughs> no. Never the twain shall meet. No way. We have completely different prayer styles. So what do we do? We keep it real simple. I get up in the morning, just as I did this morning. Lord, thank you for allowing me to see the light of another day so that I may give honor, praise, and glory to your most holy name. And then I come back from the bathroom I jump back in bed. I grab my wife. Lord, I thank you for the gift of my wife. I thank you for these 21 years together. I thank you for our beautiful children. Lord, help me to be the husband and the father that I need to be for them today. My wife says something back to me. I jump out of bed and do 45 minutes on the elliptical. How long did that take? How long, am I not speaking, you can't understand my accent? How long did that take? 30 seconds, a minute maybe? There are 168 hours in a week. And you can't take a minute a day to pray with your spouse? That's an excuse. And then you wonder why I don't have the marriage. I wish my marriage was this. I wish my marriage was that. It's your fault. The grace is there. In your marriage, God gave you the grace. That grace is nurtured and strengthened by the body, blood, soul, divinity of Christ in the Eucharist. It's there. Are you accessing it? That was probably the biggest difference for my wife and I over the last three years was praying together. Every aspect of our life got so incredibly better when we started doing that. And it's real simple. Makes a big, big difference. Number four. This is an easy one. Recreational companionship. You got to do stuff together. What happens is, as I mentioned, you get so busy in the marriage that you don't have time for each other. Like, for example, when the kids were really small, remember we had a four-year-old, a two-year-old, and newborn twins. 
We still went on a date night. Once a month. Only once a month, but it was a date night. We'd have to get two babysitters. One for the older girls, the four-year-old and the two-year-old, and one for the twins. We'd be out to dinner. And we, and of course, all she wants to talk about is the kids for the first half of dinner. That's okay. We talk about the kids. But I want to work on our, what is, where are we? Are we doing okay? Is there anything we need to work on? Are we, are we, am I pissing you off somehow? Is there anything I could do to fix this? Or are we, just that time, you know, that time just away from the kids. And people will make fun of you if you have a big family. I remember we were in the restaurant, we were talking about the kids, and we got up, and someone who overheard our conversation, not even minding their own business, said, God, I'm glad I'm not you guys with all those kids. You know how you, you, you know how that happens, right? And my wife, without missing a beat, as we're walking away, she goes, and I enjoyed every minute of it. <laughs> but finding that time to do something together at least once a month is so important for the health of your marriage. Yes, we all get busy. Yes, I travel a lot. But when I'm home, people say, well, you travel so much, you don't see your family. My friends, I see my family more now than I ever have. Because when I'm home, I am plugged in, I am engaged, I'm running errands, I'm picking the kids up from school. I'm making dinner because my wife doesn't like to cook. So I do the majority of the cooking in the house and I do all the stuff and I clean stuff. And I don't like, I don't like dogs, but we have a dog because my wife said, remember we were getting married. You said if the kids ever wanted a dog, we could have a dog. I don't remember that conversation, but now we have a dog. And so I, I, I work with the dog. Even though I don't want the dog, I work with the dog. I mean, I'm more plugged into our family. In fact, I'm so plugged in, sometimes I get in the way. For example, in the morning, I said, I'm home now in the morning. My office is right here. I walk out of the bedroom, I walk to work. Let me go help out with the morning routine for school. Now remember, I told you, I used to leave to go to work before the kids got up. I was never there for the morning routine. I said, I'm going to help now because I'm daddy. I come downstairs, what can I do? And it's like, daddy, get out of the way. There's a, my wife said, you know what, go back to bed. We'll handle, you handle the, we'll handle this part. You're just in the way. Oh, okay. You know, went back to bed. Because I like getting up anyway, so that's, I'm good with that. But see, it's these little, these little interactions, these little things that make such a big difference. Spend time together and don't make excuses because you're too busy. That recreational time together is very important. Number five, honesty and openness. You know, one of the biggest things I used to do in my marriage is the little white lie. It looks something like this. I'm in my office working. It's six o'clock. Hun, what time are you going to be home for dinner? I'll be home in an hour. Knowing when I said that, there's no way I'm going to be home in an hour. Seven o'clock comes along. Hey, hun, you almost home? Yep, I'll be there soon. And I'm still sitting in my office. 7.15. Hon, do we, you, you want us to start dinner because the kids, we have to get the kids ready. I have to get the kids ready for bed. Are you, what are you doing? I'll be home soon. 7.30. Hon, are you still at work? Oh, yeah, I got caught up in something. Oh, no, oh, now she's pissed. Oh, boy. Now, the reason why I did that was not really to upset her, but I mean, she, I, I'm thinking to myself, she doesn't realize how important my work is. I've got to get this done before I go home, or else I'm going to be home thinking about all the stuff I should have got done while I was in the office today. So that thing, so that I, so I get home. Oh, she's mad. Hey, hon, I'm hungry. Is dinner? Yeah, dinner's in the fridge. I'll put away. Go get something for yourself. And she walks away. Well, you mean I don't have a plate? The plates are in there. In case you forgot, the knives and forks are in there. The food's in there. Help yourself. She's, she's mad. Oh, boy. Now I'm figuring how I'm going to fix this. Uh -huh. How I'm going to fix this now. Oh, boy. What am I going to do? Oh, she's upset again because I came home late again. Then I start getting mad. Well, I don't know why she can't appreciate how hard I'm working to bring this money into this family. 
She couldn't keep the kids in school if it wasn't for me. Oh, they, oh my, huh? A lot, I see a lot of people smiling. You've been there. What did we do to resolve these things? My wife came up with this technique. Genius. Genius. We call it the vase technique. You know a vase that you keep flowers in? Vase or vase? So here's what we do. It was a little vase. I forget, like Valentine's Day or anniversary or birthday. I got her some flowers and and she kept the vase. So she'd have these slips of paper and a pen or a pencil. And so if I did, or if we both did something that we didn't like, we, instead of getting at it for each other, we write it down on a piece of paper and put it in the vase. So for example, I hate when you come home late and lie to me that you're still at work, and she put it in the vase. Or I don't like that you waited three days to fold the kids' laundry, and now all their clothes are wrinkled. She throw it in the vase. Then I put stuff. But we also, but we also put stuff that we liked, that we did for each other, that affirmed. So I really like when you brought me those flowers, that goes in the vase. Well, hon, I really like when you made time for me, to, and that goes in the vase. So those build up during the week. Then on Friday, the kids, we have a, we have a in-home date night. My wife loves Thai food. So I'll go to our favorite Thai food restaurant. I'll bring home dinner. The kids are in bed. We're having a nice dinner. We got Netflix waiting for the movie after dinner. And as we're eating dinner, which is a very enjoyable experience, maybe a little too much for me, right? We're going through the slips of paper. Think about this for a second. At the time that you wrote the slip of paper, you were angry and you wanted to jump in it. But now you wrote it down and a slip of paper and you forgot and you just walked away. So now as you're eating, as you're enjoying the evening, I really wish you would call me and tell me you're going to be late coming to dinner. You know what, hon? You're right. I mean, I'm really busy and I've got a lot to do. Hun, why don't you just tell me that? It's okay if you work late. But when I call and say, if you come over for dinner, don't lie. Yeah, but I didn't want you to think that you weren't important. And I, I was really trying to get out of there. But I just, just tell me you're not going to be home. It's okay. Oh, okay. And we go through. And then the positive ones. I really like when you, when you brought me flowers. You like that, huh? You like that? I'm going to keep doing it. Yeah, you like that, huh? I'm going to do it even more now. Uh-huh. Genius! Think about Guys, think about it. How long does the conversation take? You open a slip of paper, you read the thing, you talk about it for three to five minutes, and it's done. No long conversations. No, oh my goodness, I'm gonna, oh, she keeps talking, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fall off a cliff. I mean, you don't, it's three to five, and it's done. And there's the positive things that you do, and it's reinforcing. It's genius. And so we, we, by the time we finish dinner, we've gone through the whole thing. All of it's resolved and we can enjoy the movie. Why is that, that simple little technique that my wife came up with? What was so important about that? And I'll tell you. Here's what happens in marriages a lot of times. It's like, I use an analogy. Guys like to work with, not me. I'm, strange that way, but guys like to work with their hands, woodworkers and stuff. I was the kind of kid that when my father was out working on the car, I'd be inside with a book. <laughs> I'm not a very handy guy, but guys like to work with tools. So imagine you're working in your, in your shed, working, building something, you get a splinter and you, ah, and you pull the splinter out and it's, ah, and it's, ah, 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 ah. then a week goes by. And now the splinter, where the, where the splinter was in, is turning red. And it's sore when you touch it. Ow! Ah, so I just put some soap on it. Ah, I just wash it. Ah. Then another week goes by. And you notice now that you, you're having a hard time bending your finger. Because now the redness is spreading and, and it's so painful that you can't bend your finger. And so your wife notices. Hey, you should go get that checked out. 
Uh, no, nah, I'll be, just give a couple more days. I'll be all right. <sighs> you wait a few more days. Now, the infection is spreading to your other finger. So now you finally go in. The doctor looks. Your hand is infected. How did you get that? What happened? And it's been so long that you can't remember. Because you, you, you remember working, but I was just splitting. You just blew it off. And now he's trying to, how do you, you don't remember. It could be just like that in marriage. Those little digs, those little jabs, I'm right. You're wrong. I'm the one who makes more money than you. All you do is stay home with the kids. I should make the decisions. You look at this. Why about fix the car? You spend too much money. How am I supposed to pay this bill now? And all those little things, and all those little things, and they build, just like the infection, if you don't deal with it, it's going to spread, and it's going to affect the rest of your marriage. And then if you don't deal with it, you're going to be at a point in your marriage, you be like, how did we even get here? And you don't remember. That little technique, because what does that do? It deals with all the little things that, as soon as the splinter comes in, you get out, you put the iodine on it, you wrap it up, and that's what that, and that worked so well for us. In fact, we hardly even do it anymore, because that trained us to communicate better with each other. We don't even hardly use the face anymore. We don't need to, because now we're communicating so much better now. Genius. Because she's the heart. A man would never come up with something like that, right? That's the heart of love. And again, I listen to my wife because I truly believe with all my heart the Holy Spirit speaks through her. What else we got real quick? These are, next, these are pretty quick. Attractiveness of the spouse. Keeping physically fit with diet and exercise. Wearing hair and clothing in a way that your spouse finds attractive and tasteful. Yeah, we all get older. We all start to age. I used to have hair. I used to be lighter. <laughs> you know, and so my wife says, oh, hon, you know, you should work out. You should do this. You should do that. You know, and I think about that part of it. And I remember what St. Paul says. Our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. So we have an obligation and a responsibility to each other as spouses to keep ourselves Physically, mentally, and spiritually alive. We made a commitment to each other till we're dead. And we all will die. There's no question about that. But we don't help the process by being overweight. We don't help the process by smoking. We don't help the process by doing drugs. We don't help the process by looking at porn, which kills the life of God in you. And kills your spirituality in marriage. Number seven, financial support. One of the, the, the three things that I find that couples argue about the most, sex, money, kids. The, the sec, the, now this we're going over now is financial support. My whole thing was this. When my wife, my wife's a psychologist. When we started having kids, she gave up her private practice. She gave up for 10 Years until all of our children were in school. So during that time, I was the sole income provider for the family. And so I would say things like, you know, uh, hon, why are you spending so much? Why are you doing this? See, because I said, I make all the money, therefore I should make the decisions of what happens here. Not take into account my wife's non- monetary contributions to the family, which are just as important as my, my, as my making money for the family. Because we think motherhood, all you do all day is just hang with the kids. Uh, all you got to do is just change diapers and watch Barney all day. Hon, come on. You couldn't get the house clean? You couldn't get the kitchen clean? You're only home with the kids. I'm working all day. What are you doing? Oh, you know what happens there? Well, why don't you try staying home with the kids? Why don't you, you know, 
One of the things I found is the wife's mon- non-monetary contributions were just as important as my own. You know how I found this out in the big way? When I left my job and I was home during the day, especially during our summertime, which is now in the States. And the kids come to me, Daddy, we're hungry. Well, go get yourself something to eat. There's nothing there. Get us something. I'm working right now. Well, what are we supposed to do? Uh, okay, let me go look. Uh, look at, okay, there's some chips, there's some things. Uh, okay, let me go get you something. I got to stop working. I mean, I, I didn't realize how much was involved in managing kids until I left my job and had to do it myself. Number eight, domestic support. Now, financial support is a monetary contribution. Domestic support is helping with chores around the house. And again, what I used to say, well, I'm bringing in the money. You can do your part at home. Ooh, not good. So what's my job? My job, my wife gave me a great job cleaning the toilets. I remember once I was scrubbing the toilet bowl in our bathroom. And EWTN came on on our computer because we don't have cable or satellite in our house. EWTN came on. My daughter comes in, Daddy, you're on TV. And I leaned my head out of the toilet. Is that, what? Is that me? And my wife came in, oh yeah, that's you. Go back and scrub the toilet. <laughs> you know? So helping with the home and managing the chores. See, one of the things that, my, that I like to do is cook. My wife doesn't like to cook, so I do a lot of the cooking when I'm home. She loves that. Oh, good, I don't have to do it anymore. You do it. And I'm happy to do it. See, so helping out, even though you're busy, helping out with the chores around the house, even if you just do one or two things, extremely important. Number nine, family commitment. The biggest thing that we did was instituting family night. What is family night? We spend one hour a week doing something together as a family after dinner. One hour a week, that's it. We go for bike rides, we take a walk, we go pick blackberries, we play soccer or basketball in the yard, Uh, we play board games if it's raining outside. We just did something together as a family. One hour a week. So when we started doing family nights, it's getting harder now because the teenagers, You know, they got all these things that teenagers do and they all can't be home at the same time and all that, but it's getting more of a challenge. But family nights are really fun. So what kinds of things do we do? Like lately, there's a game they told me that it's called Heads Up. Have you heard about this, Heads Up? Is you get the iPad and it has words above your head and they are acting out the word and you have to guess what word it is that's above your head. You know, so like tomato. And so they're acting out like what a tomato is. And you guess uh, tomato. Yeah, you flip it down to the next word and they're acting it out. And you have to guess what word and you go to the next word. Really fun. So it's my, I never played this game before. It's my turn to play. So I, I have the thing and I'm holding up and, uh, the, and, the, and it films. The camera films this whole thing. So you flip it down, the next word. I'm doing pretty good. It's how many words in a minute. I'm going, hey, I'm doing pretty good. And finally got to a word. The word was straw. Like you sip us through a straw. So they're going. I'm like, uh, suck, drink. Uh, I'm like, and I can't get it. And so my daughter answers, stop, everybody stop. Daddy, Watch. And as, and I look, as just as a complete joke, I said, get high. <laughs> and they dropped, literally dropped to the ground laughing. They were, they were holding themselves. They were laughing so hard. And the whole thing is filming them, remember? So the timer runs out and they all grab the iPad. Let's, let's watch that again. Let's watch that again. And so they said, wait, wait. and Angela said, watch me, watch me, watch me. Daddy, watch this. Who? Get hot and he, watch Benjamin. Boy, they, they, watch, watch how he fell. And I mean, they, we have 
We have so much fun as a family now, more than we've ever had at any point in our family. And I'll tell you what, what memories are my children going to take into their own families? When daddy was at work all that time and never saw us, or are they going to remember family night? We're building memories for our children that will last a lifetime. Memories in their hearts about how mommy and daddy were so happy together and they played with us and we're all together as a family. Sometimes the kids will come to me and say, what what night's family night this week? Because it changes depending on my travel schedule. But we put that hour a week together. It's awesome. I I can't even tell you how close I am to my oldest daughter. Some of you guys, your daughter, you know, your daughter's old, your daddy's girl, daddy's little girl. Try 17. Hmm. And my daughter, to this day, I'm sitting on the couch. She will come and snuggle up next to me. I'll have my arm and she'll put her head, she'll force her head through my arm and I'll put my arm around her and she'll just put her hand on my chest. She'll say, Daddy. She's 17. I'm like, hi, sweetie. And I kiss her on the head, and we just snuggle for a few minutes. Come on, man. I missed all that before because my job was so important. Our family life has never been better. Now, all the stuff that I'm saying to you now, do you, mean, do you need a master's degree in theology for, for all of that? No. You just have to have a commitment to take seriously When he says, go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life, go and actually do that and start in your family. The church of the home. Last one. Admiration. Admiration. What do I mean by admiration? Just as my wife needs affection, I need admiration. I need my wife to let, my wife needs to let me know that she appreciates the sacrifices that I make for them, how hard I work for them. So the same way she needs affection, I need admiration. Let me tell you about a time where that was strained. I would come home, sometimes if my flight is delayed, I get home late and I take a cab home from the airport instead of having my wife, dragging my wife one o'clock in the morning out of bed. So I get home, and we have a minivan, because we have kids, and that's what you do when you're parents, you get a minivan. And the light is on, the one of the interior, because where the kids sit, they all have their own light, dome light. So I see the light is on. So I said, hmm, why is the light on? So I go into the house, I go to bed, I wake up next morning. Hey, hon, how was your trip? It was great. Hey, hon, I noticed that the light was on in the van. Oh, whose was it? I think it's Sophia. Oh, okay, next time I'll tell her, because we have a rule. When we turn down our street, you turn off the lights, because that way we won't forget to turn off. So she forgot. Okay. I come home late for another trip. Another light is on in the van. So I go in, and, hey, hon, the light's on in the van again. Uh, you know what? We were bringing in groceries. The kids were helping me bring in groceries, and I forgot to double check to make sure that the light was off. Okay, I come home a third trip, and the light is on again. So now I'm getting upset, because now I'm thinking, how hard is it, really, for her just to check to make sure the light... Now, why am I getting upset about a light? When I leave, I want to make sure things are secure at home. So if you leave the light on, it's going to drain the battery and the thing, and you may have to call somebody to get a jump and all this, some strange guy coming to the house to fix the car. I, I don't want that. I just want everything to be okay. So just I just do this and everything will be fine. So now I'm feeling she's not respecting me because she won't do something simple like turn the light off. So now I bring it up again. This time a little more forceful tone. And then she hits me back with, well if you were here more, maybe you turn off the damn light. Whoops. Now we're in it. Boom. Let me ask you a question. Why couldn't I just open the van door, turn off the light, and not even bring it up? Why? 
Very simple. Pride. I could have avoided the whole thing just by opening the door, turning off the light myself, and not even making an issue of it. But how many times in marriage do we take these things and we make issues of them because of pride? I'll show her, I'll do him, and I'll do... Come on. The way you defeat that is admiration. So when I do those things, you know, I do little things like that, or, or my wife, you know, I'll come home and she knows I'm tired. Kids, kids, leave, okay, daddy, daddy's tired. And so I'll come home and she'll help me unpack. She'll help me, you know, do things. She'll tell me about the mail and some important things that are going on and while I'm thinking. And that really helps me to reacclimate back into the family. And we'll lay in bed that night and she'll say, hon, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate the sacrifices you make for this family. I know you travel a lot. And I, just don't, I know sometimes you don't like to travel as much as you do. But I can't tell you how much we appreciate what you're doing. In fact, in about 10 minutes, I'm going to show you how much I appreciate. Oh, God, I'm like, yes, man. Come on, man. That's awesome. I'm not the one initiating now. She is. Come on, man. That's awesome. That, you see, and here I am thinking, I look at my parents' marriage. And I look at my marriage. And I'm saying, this, it's still work. Okay? It's still, but this is so much better than what I, see, let me explain a principle to you. I am a child of divorce. But guess what? My past formed me into the person I am today. But my past does not dictate my future. I don't have to make the same decisions my father made. I don't have to make the same mistakes he made. I can choose different. I can choose to put Jesus Christ first in my life. I can choose to do these 10 things even when they're hard. And because I do this, I can stand before you today and tell you the truth. That I love my wife more now than the day I married her. So as we end our time together, I just want to say that the family... Please don't forget that Jesus Christ in the Eucharist is the heart and soul of the family life. Remember, what was the heart and center of Joseph and Mary's marriage? Jesus Christ. And he must be the heart and the center of our married life as well. The family needs the nourishment of the Eucharist to survive. We need the Eucharist to survive. Jesus tells us, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life. How can you have life in your marriage without Christ? You can't. Always remember that Jesus Christ is the fountain from which you will draw the strength and the power and the grace that you need to help each other do what? What's the purpose of marriage? To help each other do what? Yet to heaven. Amen. I'd like to close with a prayer if we could. In the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Most Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you for the example of the Holy Family in which the Savior of the world was prepared for his mission. Pour forth your Spirit upon our families that we may be what you want us to be a communion of life and love. Let not our individual desires and wants obscure your wonderful plan for us. Never let hurt or differences or selfishness draw us apart. Fill us with love and forgiveness toward each other centered on your love and forgiveness toward us. 
Mary, mother of the church, be the mother of our family, the domestic church, the church of the home. Joseph, patron of the church, guard, protect, and serve our families as you guarded, protected, and served Jesus and Mary. Holy Family, as you always followed the course the Father mapped out for you, so help our family to stay on course toward our eternal destiny with you in the glory of the Most Holy Trinity. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. I appreciate it. God bless you. We hope you've enjoyed this presentation brought to you by Perusia. Perusia is an Australian-based apostolate bringing you the best in Catholic formation resources. Visit the website at www.perusiamedia.com. Thank you for listening, and may God richly bless you and your family.